Hey folks, welcome back. This is Elliot with the Poor Pearls Almanac here today, and we're a podcast. Yay! You can find us on Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, you can find us on Patreon if you're enjoying what we're doing here and you'd like to help us cover some of the costs of hosting the podcast. We don't explicitly offer any of our traditional content focused on specific goals of this podcast to our Patreons um, in terms of limited access or anything like that right now. Knowledge is for everyone. But we have started up a Patreon-only miniseries called The Prologues, during which we will do some critiques on various ecological subject matters. We've also included clips of this entire series up on our Patreon as well. So if you want to hear stuff from all the episodes, go check it out. We've also released one episode that was asked by popular demand for public consumption. So that's a good place to check it out and see if you'd like to hear more of it. On top of this content, we've got stickers available, and we're including footage from Andy's farm, putting the theory that we're talking about on the podcast into practice. So if you want to see what's going on over there and check out some animals, go check out the Patreon. Any support we can get to offset our actual costs, we fully and wholeheartedly appreciate. So go check us out. We're also on Instagram and Facebook if you still use those forms of social media. They seem to be getting pretty annoying, but if you are on there, check us out on there as well. So what are we doing today? So today we are talking with Jackson Landers. He's best known for his book, Eating Aliens, as well as his book that he wrote called The Beginner's Guide to Hunting Deer for Food. If you're not familiar with those works, I highly recommend them. Eating Aliens is a great collection of stories, we'll call it, about hunting wild species that have begun to decimate native communities of animals and landscapes and things like that, and how to start thinking about utilizing these types of animals for our food systems. So he seems like a really interesting person to bring on and chat with about how do we think about all the different challenges that are coming across for us in terms of climate change and as species start moving out of their natural habitats because of the temperature changes, how that's going to impact things like what's considered an invasive species and what is our role in helping those species get to environments where they can continue to live and really start thinking about these bigger context questions of what is our role as a species along these lines of global change. What we're really talking about is how to find ways to utilize the landscape that we've created because we really can't just go back to how things were before invasive species came in and how we can utilize them and make them accessible to people that might not be into trying new and different foods or eating with that kind of ecological understanding and uh, making those foods accessible. Sure. So that's a really long-winded way of saying uh, dealing with globalization and the invasive species that you know new trade routes and global trade routes have introduced, I guess, how, how products and goods are being shipped around the world. There have been some invasive species that people have introduced to new ecosystems. And I guess he's pointing out one solution would be to eat them if they taste good. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And um, one question I failed to ask him was what pairs, what hot sauce pairs best with like an invasive Like iguanas? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Like (laughs) Sounds good, right? Yeah. So hopefully you guys enjoy this. So Jackson, thanks so much for coming on. You've had a pretty varied career surrounding the area of animals, both in consumption and conservation. And I think it's fair to say you're probably most recognized for your work with the book Eating Aliens, which, by the way, was a book that when I read it, I was just starting to get into the idea of hunting for meat. So it was like not only me getting into that arena, but also kind of this peripheral, very specialized part of that area. Could you introduce yourself a little bit for people that are listening? Uh, Yeah, sure. So um, I started hunting for food as an an adult beginner, and um, it was a really difficult process because there weren't resources for anyone to learn how to do that. And once I did get good at it, um, I had a blog that was widely read. I put put a post on there saying, if I taught a class on this, would anyone want to do it? And then uh, a couple days later, I had a waiting list. You know, I had a Monday night group and like a Wednesday night group. And then the New York Times wrote an article about my classes and I was getting 300 emails a day. I started doing weekend courses where everyone would learn. We'd spend classroom time 
together, learning about animal behavior. And uh, we'd, I'd take them to the range and teach them how to shoot. And we'd get a fresh deer on the ground and they'd learn how to uh, butcher it in a field. And then we'd do some cooking. And I had people coming from all over, literally flying from other countries uh, to do this because no one else was doing it. And, uh, and then I moved from that out into hunting invasive species. I spent a year and a half traveling around the U.S. and the Caribbean hunting and fishing for invasive species and wrote my second book, uh, Eating Aliens. Now, I will say before that, I wrote my first book, uh, The Beginner's Guide to Hunting Deer for Food. And eating, eating aliens gets more attention, but the deer book will be in print long after I'm dead. That sells year after year after year because it's just a basic text that everyone, you know, you, someone has a family member that's interested in hunting and learning how to hunt. That's what they buy for them for Christmas or birthday or whatever. Um, so I did the invasive species stuff for a while. And, and then I moved from that into, um, I accidentally became a science journalist. Uh, someone, uh, an editor at Slate read, uh, read Eating Aliens and said, will you come over and write some stuff for us? I said, okay. So I started writing for Slate and then I was doing these pieces on weird wildlife. All of a sudden I'm getting like, you know, quoted on all things considered and, um, and you know, that Slate platform really does, does a lot. And, and then an editor at the Washington Post liked my stuff for Slate. She said, will you come write some stuff for me? And I had my first assignment and I remember like I bought the newspaper and I was like, what does a newspaper feature look like? I had no idea. <laughs> I didn't go to journalism school or anything. And I spent two years writing hard science features for the Washington Post um, and, and accidentally became a journalist. And then I spent two years with Smithsonian Magazine writing, writing weekly. That was my full-time job pretty much, writing for Smithsonian. Um, and that gave me a lot of background and I reaching out into the history and other weird parts of um, the scientific world. And then I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia. And then um, on August 12, 2017, we had the Unite the Right rally here. And um, uh, I was here for it. And I spent uh, the next year, I dropped everything. I spent the next year just devoted to civil rights uh, journalism, uh, working for Rewire and the Daily Beast. I covered, I investigated white supremacists and covered um, uh, riots and rallies all over the Eastern US for a year. Got pretty burned out from that. And I spent a year um, uh, as a, um, a com embedded communication specialist in a forest entomology lab, getting a whole other perspective on invasive species. So I worked at the University of Florida for a year. And then uh, I came back home to Charlottesville and the lockdown happened. And so now I'm just writing a new book. <laughs> okay. And that, that's my story. <laughs> awesome. What are you writing about right now? Uh, the book right now is about, so I don't want to say the name of this group because it's one, it is, there's this thing that I found that if it got put on Reddit would ruin the whole thing. But I found a culinary organization in New York City that was founded by Alexander Hamilton in part in the 1890s and it existed until the 1930s. And so I'm writing a complete history of this culinary organization and about their relationship with a particular street gang that was affiliated with the Dead Rabbits. So it's historical nonfiction. There's gangs in New York stuff, play, and there's there's presidents and senators and scandal, and I'm just having a blast doing it. So That's it's awesome. A yeah. massive amount of newspaper research. Pretty different from the hunting stuff. Yeah, yeah there's Tammany stuff involved in that. If you're talking about Dead oh god, Rabbits. there's so much. Oh dude, you don't even know. I have like. I've learned so I've, I've uncovered so much new stuff about Boss Tweed and the Tammany Ring that people don't even know about because a lot of this history was sort of put down before there was it was codified before um, we had searchable digitized archives of newspapers right right so right. people sort of like back in like the 1950s it was like we've written the final draft in this we know everything that happened and then I, I so this grew out of research I was doing assignments for Smithsonian Magazine doing newspaper research. I started finding no one now all this, this stuff has been digitized. There are all these new scandals, all these new characters, all these new stories that historians, you know, 70 years ago, they had no way of finding this stuff because it's just you can't read all the newspapers. We're right? piecing it together, right? Yeah, so there's information that just nobody has gone after that I'm I'm just I just happen to be the first person to go look for some of the stuff since these papers have been de uh, digitized. But yeah, lots of awesome. Tammy Hall. It's it's I'm having a blast doing. Yeah, it. yeah. that sounds I'm awesome. Forward to go, going fishing again. Yeah, I can't wait for that. That that's so cool. All of that stuff in Charlottesville. You were you working as a journalist or were you um, like we? Journalist. Okay. Yeah, I was. I had started taking some assignments before the rally, like about six months before. I started taking freelance assignments for like a, our local papers here in Charlottesville, the Seba Weekly, because so I was doing all the stuff at a really high level. I'm writing for the Washington Post. I did a feature for the New York Times, um, but I have no background in journalism, right? Like normally, you would start out at the bottom and you would get a, you know beat assignments. You cover school board meetings and you learn. And I started getting worried about what. I didn't know that I didn't know, you know, because I didn't, I hadn't come up through newsrooms. 
And so I started taking these local assignments just so that I could learn more about journalism. So I ended up some of the, the, the people concerned, like Jason Kessler, the organi organizer of the rally, I was the first person to ever write any article about him. And I was there, all these events that led up to it, I was there for because I was covering them for the local paper. And after the, um, the riot happened, I realized all these people are trying to write about this event. And I'm the only guy who was actually there for all of it, right? Like I knew who all the characters were. I grew up here. So I know this lawyer and I know that prosecutor. And, and I had been personally present for all, you know, the Tiki, uh, the Tiki uh, Torch Rally and uh, all of the, the things that led up to it. And I was like, and realized I can be there afterwards. I, can, I was able to go into all the courtrooms and cover the hearings and the trials. I could run into the clerk of the court's office and grab documents in a way that national journalists covering this from DC, New York couldn't do. So I felt like a sense of responsibility. It was like, I'm in a position to do this. Nobody else is going to, so I should. And I, I, th I thought I was gonna write a book about it and I have all the materials, but I was just so sick of the subject after a year. Yeah. Sure, I was like, sure. I'm gonna go to Florida and, and um, uh, you know, fish for an invasive uh, fish and, um, and and study entomology. And that's what I did. Yeah. yeah. And also inadvertently turning into a journalist is no small feat. That's not something. But I made a film then too. I, I, I wrote and co-produced a, a, a documentary film, uh, Charlottesville Art Streets, that got glowing reviews, but is in hell in terms of getting it onto a streaming platform. But we, we screened it in, in the US and in Germany and, a bunch, and at, uh, I, what was it, the Soho Film Festival in New York. Um, so yeah, I, I got to be a filmmaker as well also. That was cool. So, uh, so, so you're well-rounded. Um, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, Broad, but not necessarily deep. Yeah, well, you know, it could be worse. So I, I kind of want to focus on the um, the hunting and the eating invasive component that you've really, I guess, before Charlottesville had kind of encompassed a good amount of your background. And, um, you know, one of the things that when I was reading and you brought it up a couple times in the book is this idea of like how convoluted our food system is in terms of if we ever wanted to meaningfully incorporate this into our food system. And I just I was curious what your thoughts were after all of the research and the work you had done, especially now with your scientific background. What kind of options do we really have in terms of utilizing those resources? Yeah, so it's really it's, it's a regulatory issue. So um, the USDA regulates interstate commerce in food, right? That's where that's the interstate commerce, interstate clause in the Constitution. That's where a lot of these regulatory issues kick in. And in order to um, sell meat across state lines, for some reason, this doesn't apply to fish, uh, an animal has to be killed in a USDA inspected and approved slaughterhouse. Um, so with a lot of invasive species that you would hunt, it's not practical to like the cost of setting something like that up. Like even if you have a slaughterhouse that's normally handling beef, for them to handle on, um, you know, iguanas or pigs or, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Nilgai antelope or something, you would have to shut everything down, sterilize everything, switch. It would it cost so much for such a small stream of revenue that it's just not going to happen. Um, but a couple of thoughts on that. One, um, you know, there are in populations of invasive pigs in areas where there are already USDA, where there's enough of a pork industry that there are already um, assembly lines for pigs. And it is possible to trap wild pigs, get them onto a, um, a livestock carrier and take them to a, um, uh, a USDA approved facility. Those animals are gonna be harder to work with than domestic animals, but that is possible. And that has been done in some cases. Um, another observation I'd make is that that's interstate commerce. So Texas or any state you know, that has their own regulatory agency and they, they, they regulate themselves within the state. Like, so Georgia or Texas or Alabama have so many wild pigs that you could, you could set up, um, you know, you could hunt those pigs and slaughter them and just sell them within that state. And so that would be another solution. And yet another solution would be to change the regulation on this at, at a federal level, which I realize is really hard to do. Washington has been broken for the last 10 years. Legislation doesn't really seem to happen. Even the farm bill, which is where you would slip something like this in, doesn't function the way that it used to be. Um, but you know, in, in Europe and in the United Kingdom, um, they don't have any regulation like that. Like you can go in, in the UK, there are uh, butcher shops that have a uh, wild game in them. And, um, and it's not like, oh, people are getting sick. Right. Like it works just fine. Um, you know, there's no inherent reason why you can't kill a, um, uh, you know, a wild invasive 
deer or pig, cool it, you know, gut it, cool it down quickly, and then take it to a butcher shop. That's perfectly safe. We know this because there's, you know, massive amount of data from decades and decades and decades in the UK for this. So those are my thoughts. So this is really a regulatory problem, and it's one that's solvable on a few different levels. And, and again, it has been solved a little bit. I mean, I have seen... Um, uh, there has been what they label as wild boar, which you can just say pig, really. But there's you've seen uh, some of this make its way into kind of niche restaurant or not restaurant. Well, yeah, restaurants even and grocery stores around the U.S. And those are pigs that were trapped and taken live to a facility. So it's solvable on a few different ways, and it's happening bit by bit. Do you think? Like, I'm just kind of curious, like, we always talk about, like, oh, we have these invasive issues. Like, putting that in context of like a food. Is it something that could actually become a meaningful part of uh, the diet of, like, say, a region or a community? Or is it like, yeah, there's a lot of them, but it's not that high of a volume as you might think? Yeah, that's a good question. In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. That's what I learned working on eating aliens is that this is not not a one-size-fits-all approach. You can't hunt everything, um, you know, every problem away for food. But I would say, okay, one really good example is um, the, um, the silver carp, the Asian carp in the Missouri River and that whole drainage, there is no reason. I mean, this is a fish that literally jumps into the boat on its own. Oh, what are we going to do about it? And there's this weird prejudice that has grown up against carp in the United States where like there's a stupid joke that fishermen who've never eaten a carp say, oh, what's the way that your best way to cook a carp is, oh, you, um, well, you, you fillet it and you, um, you rub it down with lemon juice and well, with some salt and pepper and oregano. And you put it on a piece of cardboard and you bake it for an hour and a half and then you throw away the fish and eat the cardboard. <laughs> yeah, it's this joke that they tell again and again. And none of those guys have ever eaten or caught a carp for the most part. It just, it tastes like any, I've eaten lots of carp and it tastes like any firm white fish with a flaky texture. Like in a, in a blind test to, taste test, you would not know the difference between that and cod. And it's just that it's, it has a different bone structure. So you can't fillet it according to the way that people are used to filleting a bass or catfish. They have these, that family of fishes have these, these floating, it's like an extra set of ribs that go the other way. Okay, so you have to cut your fish up differently. Or you can, uh, there's a guy named Philippe Parola in, uh, in uh, Louisiana, who's a, a French chef. He came up with a method for steaming the meat off then there's no reason why you can't fish this thing out there. And you know, the, another, another thing with a with silver carp is that you have to, um, you have to process it really quickly. You have to cool it down. Like there are a lot of fish that you can catch and leave in the boat for a few hours before you process and they'll taste fine. Carp need to be processed faster. Um, but it's a, it's a resources that, resource that can be fished on a huge scale. And, you know, you look at what's like, I mean, you've asked most people what's in the McDonald's filet of fish no idea and mcdonald's and you know companies like that that make the, that or fish sticks they deliberately don't brand the species because they want to change their sourcing as different things become available so you know it might be haddock um it might be um it might be one 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 white fish or another from one year decade to another um so we could start putting silver carp in that stuff that would make a really big difference so that's an example um lionfish i think to a certain extent um i, I we're not going to exterminate them by fishing but at least regionally we can identify areas that we're gonna we're gonna um make safe for threatened species by making sure they have a refuge so there are species where we can do this with yeah so th- it it'll never like- happen with armadillo <laughs> right so it sounds like this rides the fine line between um you know controlling an invasive species and then also conservation where it's not quite um, eradicating a problem, but it's kind of uh, holding it in check to a point where it becomes more sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. And so you're making a really good point that is missing from most coverage of invasive species in the news, which is that uh, there tends to be um, tends to be a tendency that's poor English um, to say, "Oh, well, we can't possibly get rid of them all." So this, like people say that about lionfish. I've heard, I've heard, heard, you know, policy people say, "Look, you can't possibly get rid of all the lionfish by doing that." But that's not the point. It's you know, you don't have to completely get rid of them. It's it when so so much of the danger of invasive species is the threat of extinction to other species. And if you can stop that extinction by at least creating a refuge, and that was one thing when I when I was fishing for lionfish, there was this guy named Mojo White. Um, who's a, a surfer, somewhat of expat in um, in the in the Bahamas on Eleuthera, and I stayed with him. I was out there for I guess, I guess a couple of weeks, and I spent some time. His house is like it's like Pee Wee's Playhouse for surfers. It's like everything's like kind of homemade stuff that come came up on the, on the beach, and like 
you know, I, it was it was quite a it was quite a place to stay with a really weird cast of characters that came through. But Mojo's philosophy was he has a couple of patries that he hits again and again. He takes his friends, and I I went and and um and you have to get them with a spear or I guess you could maybe use use a net. You can't. They're they, they're they're so close to structure to coral or or, or a wreck that you if you drop a line with a hook or or you know you can't trawl for them or something. Everything's going to get tangled. Up. So you have to go down underwater with your snorkeling gear and stab them one at a time. And I dove reefs that that he hadn't been fishing and it was just kind of dead. You would get a whole bunch of little bait fish every now and then a skate would come by. But like we know what a coral reef is supposed to look like in the tropics because we've all seen these documentaries. But then when they make these documentaries, they go out of the way to show the most like lush, healthy areas. And a lot of these reefs, it was just these little bait fish and um, and lionfish because the lionfish were eating the little fish before they get big enough to be the big fish. And these were just so I mean, I won't say completely dead, but all of the, you know, the parrot fish and, and, the, and the blue damsels and all that stuff and the grouper, they weren't there because they eat the baby grouper before they turn into big grouper. And then I dove the, the reefs that Rojo had been fishing and it looked like, you know, one of those, you know, um, Discovery Channel documentaries where you have all of those fish around. And that's the difference. And, and, it, and, and the lionfish eat wrasses, right? Cleaner wrasses. They're these little fish that um, will, will pick parasites off of other fish's bodies. And fish will come from all over the ocean to these patch reefs where the wrasses are. To get so cleaned up. To get cleaned up, yeah. And they don't eat the wrasses, right? They're like, this is my bro. And the wrasses will come and sometimes even take parasites out of their mouths. But lionfish are from the Pacific. They don't know these Atlantic wrasses. And so they're on the, on the reef and the wrasse comes up and the lionfish just eats it, right? And, and so you think about that, if you have an increased parasite load on these, you know, these deep sea, uh, these pelagic species that come in, you know, you have an effect of that parasite load. We don't know what that's going to do to those fish populations that aren't even, you know, that, cl that closely tied to the reef. But if you, but there's still something, right? This way, the wrasses won't go extinct. I'm not, I haven't seen a paper that says wrasses are going to go extinct, right? I'm basing this on, you know, some anecdotal evidence of stomach contents and people observing the meeting the wrasses. But, you know, whether you lose 100% of a species or 99%, that's a huge difference. So, yeah, it's not all or nothing. You can take, you can say, this is my backyard and I'm in charge of it. This is my couple of acres and I'm going to remove all the invasive plants from it. And I'm going to make this a safe haven for maybe, you know, um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to make sure that um, the, I'm, I'm going to get rid of the um, uh, starlings that are nesting here. And I'm going to open up nesting nesting habitat for yellow-bellied sap suckers or some endangered species of bird. And that's that little lifeboat that you've made in your backyard. And I think that's profound. I have some Japanese knotwood that are not weed that uh, is just like taking up a chunk of my front yard. And I'm like torn between the Internet telling me to pour gasoline on it and like trying to find a more ethical uh, way to don't pour it. gasoline. Yeah, no, no, don't put gasoline. Uh, I, I wouldn't actually. Um, but it's, <laughs> there, there are days when I look at it and I'm like, I just ripped that up like two days ago, and it's like grown six inches. And I'm just like, you got to be kidding me. Uh, <laughs> Does it, I don't know. Will it work if you if you put a stake a tarp over it to block the light for a couple weeks? I've heard people have done that, but it sometimes will take multiple years, and you have wow. to like spread the tarp multiple. Like, if it's a three by three patch, you might have to spread it twelve by twelve. So it's it's a very uh, intensive process, so I haven't quite figured yeah. out what to do, but I have found out that the the young sprouts do taste like asparagus, so there's that. Oh, but, cool. it, but I've heard, yeah, I haven't, that, that's one of the, there's some, there's, I, you can't do it with all the invasive species, you know, I, I do, I do some foraging for, for plants, including invasive plants, but I ha do not have much personal experience with not weed, so uh, <laughs> I, I can't offer much advice, but I'm glad you're trying. So speaking of the food component, I think when you start talking about a lot of these animals or plants in the case of the Japanese knotweed, that people get very hesitant. I mean, I think Americans as a whole have a hard time with the idea of eating new things that isn't like, I, I guess, doesn't have that image, you know, is something that you would want to try. Um, so yeah. I'm kind of curious about in your experiences, if there's a particular uh, way or a specific food that you're like, if I wanted to show people that wild food, specifically invasive species, uh, this is the thing I would serve them so they could see like what it could taste like. Well, I think it's I, I, I don't think that people are going to buy into the idea of a food based on the category of it being invasive. You have to get really specific with the ingredient and find a way to show it off. Actually, this reminds me. So I I just did a um, 
just a couple of weeks ago, I reproduced a recipe for ketchup from, 18, from 1835. And ketchup is a really interesting, it turns out to be a really important, this, I, I promise this is going to make sense in a minute. If you look at the history of the tomato in the United States, tomato came from the Americas, but not from what's now the United States. So it originated in South America and people were using it, made its way to Mexico and it was used in Central American cuisine and they developed it. And then it came, and then the Spanish took it to Europe. It was kind of this niche curiosity that few people ate, but they didn't really know what to do with it. You know, it kind of took off a little bit in Italian cuisine. And then it made its way back to the Caribbean through um, probably through the Spanish bringing it there. And then from the Caribbean, some immigrants brought it to North America and people started growing. It was rich people grew it in their backyard, but they didn't know what to do. It was just like, they didn't have recipes for it. And it's this delicate fruit that you can eat for like a week. You know, you spend all spring and summer taking care of it. They didn't have refrigeration and it gets ripe at a time when there's a million other things to eat, right? You've got all these other harvests coming in. And those were things, this is before canning existed, right? We're talking about like, like around 1800. Uh, you, you didn't have refrigeration, didn't have canning. It was, wasn't like the tomato tasted good enough, but there was no point because there were so many other things that you could, you, you could be spending your time that, that would, you could store like corn and squash and beans that you can drive. Um, and, but what changed it was ketchup. Ketchup had been made with mushrooms. And they, so I just read this guy's whole uh, PhD dissertation on the history, history of the tomato, and I was stunned. He provides this really good information. It says that it was some, a couple of recipes were published for tomato ketchup instead of mushroom. And you were supposed to put it in a bottle and it gets better over a period of a couple of weeks. Now you have a way to store, uh, to store tomatoes. And so recipes for ke- from people already liked mushroom ketchup. And these recipes for tomato ketchup started popping up all over the place in newspapers. And it was something that you could sell. They could go into a market and be like, oh, tomato ketchup. Now I know what tomatoes taste like. Oh, this is, this is pretty good. And that became the reason to grow tomatoes was to make ketchup. And then canning was invented and we had refrigeration and they managed to stretch out the, the harvest season. So there's months of tomatoes. And that's how we have tomato in the American diet. It come, came down to somebody found that thing that they can do. They made ketchup. They made this thing in a bottle that someone could taste and have some idea with a, what, a, with what a tomato tasted like. And it had this, pro, this profound impact. And that's literally why it's in our diets today. So I would say like with any ingredient, you know, whether it's um, um, either the, uh, the wild mustard or kudzu is you got you to gotta come up with your ketchup, you know, your dish that makes it sexy, that makes it accessible, where I, I don't think there are a handful of weirdos like maybe you and me that will eat something just because it's invasive but for everyone else you've got to give them that dish that opportunity to try it where they're not stepping out of their comfort zone right like again when those americans in the you know 1820s 1830s that were taking it was they oh they already knew they liked mush- mushroom ketchup now i'll taste the, the tomato ketchup so think about it in those terms um and with kudzu here uh, actually i did a um i did a, 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 a thing for npr once on cooking with kudzu or for us friend who was a uh, the chair of the local slow food chapter um he and i we, we cooked what, was uh, this in food. sorry to cut you off was this in georgia no no this was in charlottesville okay charlottesville you got kudzu, did- kudzu kudzu runs yeah. all over and it's kind of becoming actually just started in the last couple of years global warming it's they're not dying back there the used to just be spotty here but now it's really starting to take over with the warmer weather yeah yeah but what um so we we tried to cut to a couple different ways one of the things so you really the younger shoots are a lot better and you have to parboil them really quickly because they have these little hairs but one thing that really everybody who tasted it really liked was kudzu pesto um, we, and people already know what pesto is like. They like pesto. Oh, it's got a different plant in it. That might be that might be your tomato ketchup kind of equivalent there. And the other thing I wanted, one thing I've wanted to do for years and just never had all the pieces come together. I would like to, as I need, if I could find a friend who has, or someone with um, a booth at a farmer's market, I'm pretty sure that if that would let this person, if this person would let me, you know, come and have a and I'd want a camera there and I'd want to film it. I think if I went and gathered a bunch of wild kudzu and packaged it up nicely, like anything else at a farmer's market and had a little sheet with cooking instructions, I think the key would be to sell it for like more than organic kale. Right? It's like, like, Oh, this is $10 a bag, dude. You know, this is, this is the good stuff. Yeah. The, pre, the primo, the primo yeah. kudzu. Yeah. They'll buy it. If you, if you like free kudzu, no one will want it. 
but I think that, that would actually work. And yeah, um, the the uh, illusion of elitism. Pandemic, I don't know that I can do it this year, but you're not wrong though, because I mean, if you give them the warning that it's dangerous if you don't cook it right, you're gonna have a hard time like eating it. There's a little danger, you know. Well, it's not gonna hurt. It would just be like unpleasant in your mouth. But it's, like, it's, yeah, it's sure. the same so the food sort of thing. <laughs> it's it's the same as nettles, right? Because you can eat nettles too. It's the same thing. I don't know that's the same. I don't know that there's so I don't I don't think there's a stinging chemical in them. I think it's just I've, uh, certainly I've never been stung handling kudzu, but it's similar in the sense that there's little spiky hairs. Yeah. OK. And so kind of like hops. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good comparison. Yeah. Like, yeah. OK, fair enough. Yeah, I've actually wild hops. I've all I've long been meaning to try. So I know they don't. I've, I've been a home brewer since I was 17. And another thing I mean to do every year and haven't gotten around to is trying to use some wild hops, which are the japonica is a big problem here in Virginia, along riverbanks, especially trying to use that uh, for um, for some flavoring, um, you know, uh, uh, flavoring hops. It doesn't contain the same alpha or beta acids. It would so it wouldn't be the same thing. It wouldn't be a straight substitute for um, domestic hops. But I think that's an experiment that needs to be done. Yeah, I know uh, two roads in um, Connecticut. They do something similar with a land race hop variety from, I think, New Mexico or somewhere around mm-hmm. that region. Uh, they did one batch of a beer. It was very different. Highly recommend. Sure, you say different, like, like it, it, uh, I don't know. I, I had it like two years ago. So I, I remember thinking it had some very interesting flavors, but now I can't really remember what those flavors were. Yeah. I just remember being like, I've never drank anything that tasted like this before. <laughs> huh. So I don't know if they're still making it, but they, they did do something like that. So oh, cool. there's definitely... Uh, a uh, possibility for some really great beer out of that. One of those things where, like, you can't make a really, you know, macro level impact on wild hops by that. Like, you're, there's no way you're ever going to harvest enough for it. But it's a resource that you can direct in a productive way. And, you know, it's a, a drop in the bucket that gets you all, you know, closer to a full bucket. So, so I was going to say to round out the food component, um, this reminds me of. I worked in a lot of restaurants and a lot of kitchens. And as I was on my way out from no longer working in the service industry, I saw a lot of Chilean sea bass coming around. And I was yeah. curious as to what Chilean sea bass was. And I looked it up and they don't exist. And there's this, whole, there's this whole, yeah, the Patagonian, uh, to- Patagonian toothfish. So w- was that an invasive species that somebody found uh, the way to make it, you know, tasty and look good on menus? Yeah. No, no, it's not that it was in, it's invasive. It was a fish that was plentiful decades ago that didn't have much of a market. And it's, this is basically some marketing people in the seafood industry. It was kind of genius. They didn't, I mean, I don't think they had any sense that you would be, they would start uh, fishing them out of the habitat, but someone came up with the idea of like, well, can we read, nobody wanted to eat something called Patagonian toothfish. I mean, I would, but um, so they got they got legal permission to market it as Chilean sea bass. It is not uniquely Chilean. It's taxonomically not a bass. <laughs> I guess it's from the sea. That much that much is accurate. And it was a marketing thing. So no, it's not, not uh, Chilean sea bass is not invasive. Quite to the the contrary, it's being out, out fish. It takes a long time. I forget exactly how old, but these fish take a long time to get to full size. And it is. It is not sustainably fished. It should come off of menus completely. This is an this is a, an animal that could be fished to extinction. And here's the ridiculous thing about it is there've been a few, I think a couple times in the last 15 years, the New York Times has done these interesting um, investigative pieces where they went around and got samples of fish being sold at restaurants and in uh, seafood markets from around New York City and, and had DNA tests done to see, and they're not the only ones who've done this, but, they, but those, that's where I would look for one particular article on it. And then to see what percentage of them are what they're, what they're labeled as. And things sold as Chilean sea bass, I forget the exact percentage, but it was a surprisingly high number of times that it was some other species. And how many people were disappointed when that landed on their plate? Like zero. Like people don't, like so, so many fish taste, uh, like the taste and texture of Chilean sea bass, there's like a million fish that have that taste and texture and they're just like that, right? Like including, like literally, if you if you cut up and served uh, silver carp with care with the right sauce, m- most American, you told most Americans that carp is Chilean sea bass, they'd be like, this is the best Chilean sea bass I've ever eaten. Like they have no idea. Um, so that, yeah, that, that, that's my thought on it. Yeah. You, sh- you really shouldn't order Chilean sea bass. Um, I think it's t- that and orange roughy. Those are fish that we just need to 
stop harvesting and there's plenty of other things that we could be harvesting instead. Right. And I remember at the um, when I first started to get curious um, and it seems funny now that I say it out loud, but it was as I was leaving the service industry, I started to get curious about where food comes from. That's kind of what got me curious about where food comes from. And I, I remember looking it up and it didn't exist. And that's when I started to really scratch my head and started to dig deeper into um, how our food systems ties into, you know, going out to restaurants, going out to eat and preparing food for ourselves. Yeah. And you brought up this really interesting point when you're talking about the kudzu, about how it's kind of creeping in partly because of climate change and a habitat destruction, I think kind of accelerates that as well through suburbanization and things like that. You know, here in the United in North America, specifically in the East Coast, we are, I think, uniquely being hit by climate change in a different way that I think is pushing a lot of species north while other parts of the country are going through things like droughts and excessive rains. While here, uh, there's like a very clear creep of what's coming. Like you can look south and you know where you're going to be in 20 years. Uh, oh, and I'm, you know, as these species come up, I'm, I'm wondering about how these invasives start to interact and what our role is in trying to protect the native species that may no longer even be able to survive in the climate because of climate change, despite the invasives, as well as the the faster moving um, species that will be able to kind of keep moving north with climate change to survive. And, uh, you know, kind of what what's our role in all of that? Is that the future of conservation, so to speak? Yeah, in a way. Well, it's not the future. It's part of the future. It's something we'll have to think. About. And the first thing that comes into mind is, it's like, well, if well, these things have to move north, let's make sure that there's habitat north that they can move into. Make sure that there's, you know, there's, um, there's habitat that's protected. Uh, make sure that there are safe corridors for wildlife to migrate through to get to where they need to go. Um, so, yeah, make sure they've got some place to go. And, of course, you know, ultimately, um, you know, you run out of north eventually, right? <laughs> you come to the pole. Um, so it is, you know, it's a game of musical chairs and there's going to be a chair missing. Uh, but let's make sure, you know, it's, it's as few chairs missing as possible. So, yeah, make sure they've got a place to go. But we're not going to be able to keep like here in Virginia. I'm I'm pretty sure that we've got a, a small population of alligators at this point along our border with, with North Carolina. There have been enough credible sightings um, that, and that's what you would expect to happen because the, the nearest population of alligators uh, was only 12 miles south of Virginia. And so when you know, that's, they, they, they have a corridor through protected waterways, you know, to, to move up. And I'm pretty sure they've done that. And there's just not, there's not a lot you can really do about it. I mean, I guess you could, if you don't want the alligators there, you could shoot an individual alligator. Um, but yeah, the stuff that's coming, uh, do you even call that invasive? You know, there's, I guess there's a debate to be had about that. Kudzu is not native to North America in the first place. So it's definitely invasive. But yeah, if you have a species that's native to North America and it moves north with climate change, I'm not sure you necessarily categorize that as, inv as invasive. That's probably bigger, a bigger debate to have. Yeah, <laughs> black locust is kind of on the, the threshold of being considered an invasive in Massachusetts. But I, I don't see how that can really hold as the climate continues to warm. Uh, you know, it, it's just, it's going to move north. That's, that's what well, it's going to do. With trees, it, it is, it, it is huge. Um, so I spent a year working for in a forest entomology lab at the University of Florida um, uh, as a embedded communicator. So that meant like I kept up, kept, I, I was, I edited every paper that came through there. I worked on grant proposals and edited those. I wrote articles for, on behalf of the lab for like uh, entomological magazines. And um one of the biggest invasive threats that North America has right now, I think, are bark and ambrosia beetles, which are these little beetles that they sense when a tree is stressed and, um, and, and potentially unhealthy. And they chew a little hole through it and they, they dig a gallery, uh, basically a network of tunnels. Um, in, in depending on with, with bark beetles is directly under the bark and with ambrosia beetles it's farther in, into the tree and then when you what happens if you have a whole lot of these beetles their their tunnels girdle the tree and they kill it right the tree's no longer able to move nutrients up and um, we've got so many of these species that are being that are coming in shipping containers and in you know um, shipments of lumber and even finished um, uh, wooden furniture from Asia and from other parts of the world to the United States and, and back the other way, um, 
that that is a huge threat to American and European forests. And as when, and the thing is, as as climate change accelerates, we are going to have these massive events where you, if you have a whole forest of trees that become stressed um, because of a couple of weeks of droughts or or another event like that the beetles go nuts and they just attack all of the trees and you have these massive you have these situations where thousands of acres of trees at a time um, they'll die and then what happens a year or so after that you have all this dry wood that now you have a fire right that moves and then it accelerates the change and i we need to, to start looking ahead uh in, on how our forests are constructed so most like the 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 what you're talking about with the locust in massachusetts most of our, our forests on national forests and state forests, they're not natural. It's not like this is a protected area where you have something that's similar to like a pre-Columbian forest or um, you know, a, a pre-Holocene um, North American forest. These, are, these forests are planted for commercial reasons with um, species of trees that are economically useful to people. That's how those forests are constructed. And I think it's really important that we accept the fact that these beetles are there. Some of them are already here. Some of them are coming. And we probably need to start planting different trees that are going to be more durable and have more resistance against these, these invasive beetles that are coming. Because if you just kind of sit there and, you know, la-di-da, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to worry about this. You're going to have these massive events where you lose the entire forest. So we need to start redefining some of those public forests right now and replanting them, I think. I'm under the impression that this is primarily an issue with coniferous wood. With with conif with conifers? Yeah. No, no, absolutely really? not. There's the emerald ash borer is well, that's not a um, that's it's a beetle. It's not a bark or ambrosia beetle, but it's an example of the situation. You know, those go after ash trees. They're just wiping them out. They just came here a few years ago, and all the ash trees are dying. Uh, and then you have um, um, you know, you have some that that specialize in oaks. You have some um, that, that, that yeah, there's um, there's ones that go after pine trees. But no, this is almost any category of tree. And here's another problem is invasive populations are often different. So you can have a bark beetle that only that only um, there was only ate a certain, I don't know, um, uh, like a, a species of uh, laurels in its in its home territory in Europe or on an island in Malaysia or something where if you have a, a small founder population, that's a little bit different. Once that beetle is transplanted to a new area, sometimes when I mean, it's, it's encountering a different mix of trees, it could start going after something that the, 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 the original population never did, where they'll switch hosts. And when they switch hosts, you know, you may have the, the new host tree may have no resistance against it, right? It may just have no idea because trees have ways of fighting back. They can produce heavy amounts of sap, for example, that just sort of cover and drown the beetles. But if they're stressed by drought, maybe they can't produce enough sap, they may produce um signals that um chemical signals that attract a parasitic wasp or something or some kind of predator that might go in after them so there are things that trees can do to defend themselves against these beetles but if it's a totally different beetle that it's never encountered before there's tremendous um uh vulnerability there so no it's not just pine trees. yeah i was just thinking that's it's pines are such a big component of our uh timber industry that if that would probably be the the biggest driver of uh or the that most susceptible it would be the smallest ecological loss because pines and limes, as they call it in the industry, ain't great habitat. It's like the pines and limes, you kind of have to say, well, I guess it's better than if they bulldozed it and made a strip mall. But, you know, those massive plantations of, of, of you know, like southern yellow pine or whatever, you walk through them and they're just dead because there's just not, when you just have a monoculture, that's not really good habitat. But on the other hand, you are right that, you know, the lab I worked in, we got a lot of funding connected to the pines and lines kind of industry because our, our research helps protect them. So, yeah, that's what that's what's going to attract funding for this problem from, you know, um, the from the federal government, from the Forest Service. Uh, but it's also kind of from an ecological standpoint, it's, that's the part of it that I'm least concerned about. You know, we want a diverse it's going to provide habitat for a lot of different different types of wildlife. Yeah. So we could be looking at like. The American chestnut magnified. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the American ch the chestnut likely is a great example. Yeah, and it's so many different things that are coming in at once. You know, the it's you look at how when when trade changes, when trade routes change or expand or contract, um, invasive species pathways change. And I think during COVID, we've seen 
uh, everyone, so many different industries have had to change their sourcing for materials. As if you get an area in China that's locked down and they can't get work done on a factory or they can't get an export out, then you know American uh, businesses they have to look for other sources, right? So maybe something that you had been getting from China now you're going to get that from Malaysia or you're going to get it from India. And when you have shipping containers moving from in, along different routes, all of a sudden you've got new hitchhikers that come with that. Sure. Right. Yeah. And so I think I think there's I think there are probably a lot of invasive insects and fungi um, that are have been arriving in North America over the last year during the pandemic as all of these supply routes changes change that we're not even going to know about that are going to hit us over the next couple of years and it's because of these these changes in global trade. And um, there's no telling what they are. You know, we're not, we're not going to know about them until they blow up and turn into a problem. You don't notice something that small until it becomes a big problem. Yeah. You know, I think this all kind of ties into this conversation about how climate change and our economic system, especially uh, on a global scale, kind of ties to the fact that going back to how things used to be isn't really possible because the infrastructure is not there and trying to like, you know, from... It's one thing to say, we're going to get rid of clownfish, just for example. It's another thing to say, we're going to get rid of clownfish and all of these microscopic fungi and bugs. And, you know, it, there's no way to try to like re-naturalize the, the continent, especially as we continue to trade across the globe. So I, I'm kind of curious from your experience now having being on the hunting side of conservation and working in the academic side or whatever you want to call it. it do you have any hope for us to kind of uh, find a, a good middle ground between trying to solve these problems and accepting that we're never really going to be able to make things perfect again? Because I, I feel like that's always a, a huge concern on the ecological side is like, how do we get things back to how it used to be? Sort of get people to realize uh, you can't really fix it. You can only adapt and, and sort of move forward with it. So you're touching on what I think is a huge critical question First of all, break this out into a few different pieces that nobody talks about, which is people talk about restoring habitat and, uh, but to what and when, like, like you never hear a conversation to like, oh no, we want to want to go to, um, you know, um, to uh, 1491 before Columbus reached any island surrounding the new world. Well, you know, North America and stuff, the Americas were under intensive agricultural use by some very advanced civilizations that had, you know, pr that were very good at farming corn, corn and, um, and squash and beans and sunflowers. And they had advanced economies. They had domestic livestock. They domesticated the turkey and, um, and, and, and uh, the llama in South America. And they had, you know, they had, it, it, this was not a wild place. In 1491, and the descriptions that we get from early colonists that that were writing what they saw, it was a messy backyard, right? All of the it was like a backyard that nobody mowed the lawn for 20 years because the, so many Native Americans had been wiped out by European diseases that moved through the area before Europeans got here. So when we talk about oh, we're going to go back to pre-Columbian, I mean <laughs> that was not a great that was not a great wild habitat. That was a habitat that was totally adapted to the needs of human beings. So where do we go back farther? You know, the last time North America was a really healthy ecosystem was probably towards the end of the Pleistocene. And we lost all of these big herbivores and, and predators that were a part of that. We lost the mastodon, we lost the mammoth, we lost the giant camel, we lost um, uh, and all this whole assemblage of, of animals that were part of a healthy North America. And then it's just been kind of a basket case um, ever since then. So we don't have a we don't have a consensus about when we're restoring to. And I can't solve that right now. I think it would take a lot of people, smart people sitting down and having a whole series of, of conversations and symposia to figure that out. And I hope that it does happen. But what I will say is while you're trying to figure that out, you know, large parks and preserves work and are good things. You know, I don't think anyone would look at Yellowstone and say that's been a failure. Um, and and, and, and as far as, you know, what you're trying to restore something to, you know, let's have these lifeboats, whether it's a patch reef or parks the size of Yellowstone. And, and, and to even talk about, and I would say even the Pleistocene thing isn't completely out of, out of reach. You know, there's what's called Pleistocene rewilding, arguably Yellowstone and is exercising that where, you know, systematically they've taken these different species that have been missing 
Um, elk, elk, actually elk, human beings have been in North America longer than elk have, but elk still, they have a role that they can play as a big herbivore. Um, and so they brought those back, they brought the wolves back and they started finding them. When you put some of these species back and you, 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 you get a more, a better functioning ecosystem, you get something that's, um, that's serving the needs of a lot of different species. And there've been this, this rewilding concept is actually a really big deal in Europe. Um, and that's part of um, part of why they've been trying to bring they've been trying to breed back the arcs um, to start managing those habitats and and linking them with different corridors. And so it, no, it's not perfect. We're not going to turn the earth back into we're not going to go back to the Pleistocene. We're not going to go back to 1491. Uh, but we can have a series of experiments where we protect land and see, well, what can we do with it? Can we start putting back, um, you know, can we start putting back some species, some big grazers? and some predators that develop a forest into something like what you would have had 15,000 years ago. Yeah. The whole world's not going to be like that, but these are experiments that are worth doing. Sure. Yeah. And I, you know, you taught, you touched on a lot of different things that I would like to unpack, but it would probably take like four hours. <laughs> so, you know, the, the idea that the landscape was perfect before colonizers showed up and the role of indigenous farming and all of those other things that I don't think I, I worry very much often dip their toe into this concept of the noble savage a little bit they, they, would, they were disgusted when, when europeans started landing when the british were landing along the eastern east coast of the united states the the the, the natives were they, they so they they kept you know why they smoked so much tobacco like they didn't normally smoke tobacco all that much it was to cover up the smell of the unwashed english who hardly ever bathed. These are people who were scrupulously clean. And, you know, they just didn't happen to have resistance to our diseases. But you're right, the noble savage thing. Like, no, I think we were the savages. Yeah, it, I mean, like, that they they lived perfectly in tune with the land and, like, that they, they did no wrong in terms of how they managed the landscape. Like, they did a lot of really amazing things with the landscape. And obviously, this sounds very homogenous, but that, you know, that's not how it was. There's multiple different uh, methodologies of lifestyles to work with the, the local ecology, but that doesn't mean, like you were saying with um, mammoths and things like that, they did wipe out species and they learned from those experiences, but they, they still did do those things. And I think sometimes we get so caught up in trying to like portray this like perfectly almost static relationship with the landscape that never really existed. Yeah, yeah, it was changing. Yeah, they were, that was a, those were advanced civilizations that were progressive, progressing rapidly. They had, you know, like, we, we talk about them as if they were in the Stone Age. You know, what about all that gold and silver that the Spanish were taking? Yeah, right? where did that come from? Working metal, they had metal working. They had, they had, they were called working copper. This was, um, and, and, and we've, we've erased that so much. And so I've done, a, I, I have like a, a, a ongoing project and I'm hoping it'll be a magazine article at some point about um, uh, stone construction by Native Americans that actually you just go looking for them there's all kinds of stone foundations and walls all over North America I mean they, 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 they we have this denial with oh those must have been from and that must be from an old farm like it's not rocket science to pile rocks on top of each other they were building stone structures they had foundations for houses they had walls they had burial mounds they had all kinds of things made out of stone that were often exploited as sources of stone to build things. But um, yeah, they weren't like, or, or even look at examples like the Lakota, you know, we have this idea of them living perfectly in tune with the buffalo. They were secondarily um, hunter gatherers when, you know, at the time Columbus showed up, they were farmers, they were sedentary. And then, they, and then uh, things changed and they got horses and they were being pushed off their land. And so they followed the buffalo around and hunted them. But, you know, those were changes wrought by, um, by Europeans. Yeah. And uh, I know there's a lot of research going into rediscovering a lot of those lost cultivated species that we don't even know about that they had been farming. I forgot their catching. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, so there's a lot of research going into that area, which I think will be really, you know, one of the things I've, and I'm sure you probably see this too, from I used to work in academics, but a lot of research really doesn't make it to the public for like 10 or 15 years. You know, that somebody does their research, writes a paper on it. Other people see that paper, write more papers on it. And then eventually somebody writes a book or whatever, and maybe the book's a hit or it isn't. And then it takes 5, 10, 15 years to actually ever make it to like the general public. Yeah, science. So I say this having been a science journalist for years, that most science journalism is terrible. Like most news outlets don't take it seriously. They don't really professionalize it. They'll take an, a general assignment person. And um, and just say, here, go write, you know, cover the science story where, you know, 
they, they have no ability, the reporter has no ability to understand what, what the paper says or to question anything in it. And it becomes really shallow. And then the only thing that they see is something that had a press release, something that went out on fizz.org or one of those sites. You know, it's not like, you know, CNN or the Washington Post is, is it's not like they have staff who are like reading scientific journals <laughs> to see what comes out. It's like maybe, you know, if you're lucky that university or that lab has a really good, uh, you know, communications or press person. But I've worked in that setting also as being the lab's communication person. And I've seen how when I was at the University of Florida, I was unique in that I was embedded in a lab to see what to read all the papers and then to try to get press for them when it was appropriate. And the, the, but the university's main communication staff, they're, they're asked to cover like a dozen different disciplines. Like if you're trying to keep, you can't keep up with forest entomology and like satellite developments and like, you know, arthroscopic surgery advancements, right? Like, have one, like you're not going to be able to understand all those things. Um, and so it was the, the they never really understood, you know, the, the full-time communication staff for the university, they just didn't understand what was a big deal and what wasn't. And it, you know, the stuff that gets promoted, it's like, well, this professor has a lot of pull or he's really close to this dean, so we have to do that. And so you have all these papers that come out where they're a really big deal and they're amazing and it should be, you know, everyone should know about this, but scientists don't know a lot about how to interact with the media. Universities can't or won't keep up with this and newsrooms don't hire people um, and retain them long enough to specialize in this stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of different problems that that feed into the situation you're describing. Yeah. Sure. And it sounds like we have a lot of a lot of different ways to tackle these issues. There's uh foresight where we need to um, see these beetles and invasives coming. And all, all of these things tie into um, sort of how we tackle these problems and um, how we bring an ecological approach and tie conservation into it. And it's all very complex. There's a lot of moving pieces. How do you go from being a person who's curious about um, your food and where it comes from into being, like like you said, a person who starts hunting as an adult and um, wants to sort of ethically and sustainably source their protein? And, and how, where do you start? How, how does that... How, how do you go from being curious to actually jumping into um, getting into figuring out where your food comes from? Um, have the courage to uh, go out and, and, and potentially fail. I think that's a, that's a big thing um, to go out in wild places and start looking around, or if you're going to start hunting, um, you know, like, so many of my students, when I was, when I was teaching classes and guiding had this, had this terrible fear of like, what am I going to do? with the deer once it's dead, can, how do I cut it up into food? And they were, they're going to fail. And I'm like, look, as long as you don't let it rot, as long as you work quickly enough, the worst case scenario is that your meat is shaped wrong. And you're still going to be delighted when you, you know, you eat your first meal of a deer that you, or a rabbit that, that you, you harvested yourself. Um, that, you know, if you fail on that, it's actually not a disaster. It's going to, it's going to be okay. Um, so I would say that, if, but um, if, if, um, I, I, fishing is one really easy, easy way to, to start. Like, cause there's, um, you, you, you don't necessarily live like a lot of people listening to this podcast may live in places where hunting isn't super practical. If you want to do, if you want to hunt for deer, I'd say, pick up my book, the like beginner's guide to hunting deer for food, but fish are really getting easy to get into. There's, there's, so, there's probably something within 10 miles of where, wherever you're sitting that you can sustainably fish for. And so I would say go spend 30 bucks on a spinning reel combo. And there's lots of articles on the, um, uh, you know, on the internet that can, you know, or there's a subreddit fishing for beginners. It's a great resource um, for, for people to learn about that. And then look at, um, you know, there, there are great books that you can get, um, like uh, my, my buddy Hank Shaw. Um, if you look up Hank Shaw's books, he's got books on foraging. They he's got great them. books. I have a couple yeah, of them. Yeah, an introduction for one of my, from one of my books. And, um, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll steer you right in terms of not poisoning yourself if you're harvesting wild plants. And look at invertebrates too. In fact, I'm leaving tomorrow morning on a trip to um, uh, on a trip to Cape Charles in the Chesapeake Bay. I'm going to spend three days foraging for. Um, I'm going to dig for clams. I'm going to gather um, mussels at low tide and maybe crab, maybe maybe do some crab trapping if the if the water's warmed up enough. And you know, mussels are this a tremendous wild mussels a tremendously unexploited resources. And if you know if, you know, if you live on the East Coast, you, you want to make sure that there are uh, there's not a shellfish warning from your state government about you know anything anything unhealthy with it. Yeah, but, you got to watch you know, out for that runoff. 
Yeah, but as long as if you check the check the um you know the state website that'll have alerts for that, all you need is a bucket. You just walk around and you pick them up and stick them in a bucket, and there you are. And a um, license from the man. Some in some cases in Virginia, <laughs> actually, you don't need a license to gather up to a bushel of any of those things. Oh, wow. You don't even need a license. Excellent. And a fishing license is usually like going to be twenty or thirty bucks. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's a good deal. There's green crabs also. There's invasive crabs, a couple of different species on the East Coast that are pretty good to eat. It's a little bit of work for a lot, you know, not a whole lot of meat, but you can just go scoop those up, put them in a bucket. Um, you, I, I don't think you even need a license for that. Sure. So what you're saying is, if anybody's interested, um, get up, put on your your boots. And go out there and find some food and don't expect, you know, five-star dining. <laughs> Maybe drop a couple stars and, and see what you can find. Yeah, just it's basically it's it's I think a lot of people have they're they're scared of to fail. And if there's one thing that's you know helped me in my career is I just went out and like did it and um and and screwed up again and again and again until I until I got it right. And so if you don't have something, I mean if they have somebody who can teach you to fish or hunt locally, that's great. Most people who are interested in this as adults and don't have the skills yet don't have someone like that, right? Like you either grew up in a family that went hunting or you don't learn how to do it at all. Um, so I would say, look, look for books, look for resources and have the, have the courage to go out there and fail. Yeah. And, sure. um, and one thing I would say though, too, around here, at least, I don't know if it's the same down there. Freshwater is mostly poisoned. <laughs> like you're not supposed to eat pretty much anything that's freshwater around here. Where are you located? Uh, Massachusetts. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, so that's going to be species dependent. So I've got a lot of family in, in Massachusetts. Both my, my parents grew up around Wilmington. Um, and I've got a cousin who, out there who has a commercial tuna fishing license. And I've gone out with him sometimes after after other fish. But I so say even in Massachusetts, I think it's species uh, species dependent, like young species that mature quickly don't necessarily. So you, your issues in Massachusetts, I think, are heavy metals and PCBs mostly, right? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there are species where they don't accumulate as quickly. So there are things in fresh water that you can eat, like or the trout, for example. You can eat those. Those are going to be okay. But, you know, uh, a 15-year-old catfish or carp that took a long time to get full size, that's probably not such a good idea. But I think your, your, state, your state wildlife agency has, you know, information about that. There is still stuff you can eat. You just have to know what you're doing. Yeah, I think it's like you can eat like one pickerel a month if you wanted to go for pickerel. Especially on the East Coast, there aren't a very a large amount of large ponds. That's so exactly what I thought a Patagonian toothfish looked like. It's a pickerel. <laughs> Sounds like yeah, it. Well, I'm, I'm very lucky in my area in Virginia. We never had any heavy industry here. Agriculture is still light. Um, like there's nothing my, in my local river, the right man, I can eat everything out of it and it's completely safe. I'm living in the wrong part of the country. Yeah, we got to move. We got to get <laughs> we got to get down there. <laughs> yeah. Um, if people want to learn more about what you're doing, uh, where would you want to send them to? I don't have a, you know what, like I, this is so lame. I would say, you know, you can Google me and find stuff and you can read my books. I don't use social media anymore. Um, it got really toxic, especially when, when you spend a year investigating neo-Nazis, you know, I've had a lot of, I've had, I've had my break lines cut. I've had people try to kill me (laughs) from doing that stuff. Damn. Yeah. So I'm not on social media anymore. I guess that, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can email me at jack.landers at gmail.com if you want to get in touch with me. But basically, I'd say, you know, Google me. You can find lots of my work for Smithsonian and everything else. There's lots of stuff of me on 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 um, on, on YouTube. But um, I'm not an active social media guy. And I know that's kind of weird in today's world. <laughs> Makes sense. Right. Thing to promote, right? yeah. You don't have to justify anything. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a wild world now. Sure is. <laughs> So thank you so much for coming on. This is a really great conversation. I'm sure in the future we're going to want to bring you on because, like I said, there's a million things that we didn't touch on that you you hinted at that I want to dig into. But we are we can't be here all day, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we'd love to have you back. As always, if you enjoyed the episode, please give us a review on iTunes, which heavily impacts our outreach to new listeners and helps us bring on new and exciting guests. We appreciate your support, and we hope you enjoyed this conversation. Thanks for listening to the Poor Pro's Almanac. This is Andy. This is Elliot. Bye. Later. Later.